At any rate, we're going to do this a little bit differently maybe than we've done before. And in part, by the way, do I sound okay? Am I too high or too low? I'm okay? Good. Thank you, John. Um, in part, um, part, what may be a little bit different today is I may be a little bit less willing to hold back and be polite. Um, because for some of you say, hold back, Lance, you never hold back, and you're polite, you're never polite. Um, but I'm, I am convinced that our business, I don't want to get overly melodramatic, but I'm convinced that our business is at a, at a turning point, okay? And so I'm going to come at you right out of the gate, all right? I've been doing this for almost 30 years, and for about the last 20 to 25 years, there's been all sorts of talk about how our business is going to change, okay? Public access to the MLS, um, which is now basically Zillow and all the rest of that. Discount brokerage, the help you sell, the purple bricks, all the rest of this sort of stuff. Just the general business model of operating a real estate business. And I don't necessarily mean me, I mean you. You operating a real estate business. Um, and, and frankly, myself operating a real estate business as well on a little bit larger scale, a few more agents, a larger team basically. Um, but it's changing, and it's changing pretty dramatically. And there's been a lot of discussion over the last several years, and I'm talking 5, 10, 15, 20 years, that, oh, the business is going to change, and you know, it's not going to look the same you know, two years from now or five years from now. Um, and two years would come, five years would come, and the business is generally the same. It's not a whole heck of a lot of different than it was before. I don't know exactly why I can't exactly put my finger on it, but I don't think this business is going to look the same in two years from now. Certainly not going to look the same for five years from now. And in part, I think there's going to be less of you, okay? Which is odd because real estate agents kind of go up and down and up and down and up and down. And generally, anybody have any idea how many realtors there are in California right now? In California? Okay. L licensed, that's about right, licensed real estate people with a license. They took their test, they passed the test, about a half a million. Last I checked, and I did, haven't checked recently, but last I checked it was like 460,000, but that was over a year ago, so people are taking their test every day, okay? So let's just call it a half a million. But there's approximately 200,000 realtors, okay? Distinction between a licensee and a realtor. Everybody knows that, right? A licensee just means I've passed the test with the state. I have my license. Uh, you get to call yourself a realtor. Realtor, no A in the middle. Okay, not realtor. It's a pet peeve of mine. It happens, ugh. Okay, we're not realtors. We're realtors. But anyway, you get to call yourself a realtor if you do what? You pay money. Who do you pay your money to? Pay to the Association of Realtors, pay to the MLS. So for basically $1,000 a year, we get the privilege of calling ourselves realtors. Okay, and I got some slides later on. I don't know, by the way, I'm not really sure when we're going to do lunch, probably somewhere around noon. I think we got a sandwich or something for you. But I don't know whether those slides are going to come up before lunch or going to come up after lunch, but they basically talk about the volume of business that's done by percentage of folks in the business. 50% of agents in the business never close a transaction. Okay. Um, which, and that's been the, the way, that way for, for as long as I've been in the business. Half of the agents in the business, and I don't mean the half a million, I mean the 200,000 that are paying $1,000 a month to carry around a business card that says I'm a realtor, close zero business in a 12-month period. Zero. Okay, why is that? How does that, how does that make any sense at all? Okay. Well, I'll tell you how it makes sense. It makes sense because most of them don't have a, there's no why in their reason they're in the real estate business. The why I means I'm in this business because. You know, why are you here? Okay? And we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about what's your why. Why is Chuck at Cobal Banker Town and Country, why is Chuck, who left his prior career to come into the real estate business, why is he here? And this is the part where it might get a little ugly, because if you don't have a good why you're in this business, 
I'm going to suggest you probably shouldn't be in this business because you're not going to make it, okay? Unless you fall into that category of those 50% of those realtors who don't close any business in a 12-month window. And the reason why they get to stay in the business is easy because they don't have to make any money. Their, their, their bills get paid by somebody else. Their bills get paid by a spouse. Or their bills, maybe they've retired. They, their bills get paid by a pension. Um, I ran into some of you who, were at, who, who was in Vegas um, a couple weeks ago at the Cobalt Banker event. Okay, a couple of you have already heard this story, so beg my indulgence. I'm at the Cobalt Banker Conference, nice conference, about 6,000 people there. Okay, about 6,000 people. And I'm sitting next to a gentleman. This, we're in the stadium a lot. Of, it was the opening session, and there was a... Um, Lights were low, so I couldn't exactly see each other very well. But sitting next to him, looked to me like this gentleman was probably in his late 50s, early 60s, and he looked like a realtor. And what I mean by that is, and I mean that in a complimentary way, he just looked professional. He just kind of looked like a, like a, not an older man, but he looked kind of distinguished, and he looked like he knew what he was doing, and he looked professional. And he kind of leans over to me, and we start that small talk conversation, and the conversation is basically like, hey, who are you and where are you from? And I'm like, I'm Lance Martin, and I'm from Southern California, and, and I got a few of my agents here, and blah, blah, blah. I give him my 30-second elevator pitch. And then he proceeds to give me his 30-second elevator pitch, which is actually fairly professional. He presents himself very well. And he's like, oh, I'm, um, I have his name somewhere in my presentation. He's probably going to fall off his, if he ever sees this. Like, Why did Lance put my name in my presentation? Anyway, he, he, he tells me, he says, I'm Bob Smith. And I'm from Santa Monica area. Cobalt Banker, residential average. Nice office, probably, probably average sales price of a million dollar plus. Easy, okay? So I'm like, okay, great. nice to meet you, Bob. We're chatting. And he leans over, he says, well, how many of these have you been to? And I said, well, geez, I've been, to, I've been with Cobalt Banker now for about 14 years. And I think I've been to almost every single one. And he's, oh, 14 years, how long have you been in business? I said, well, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm with Cobalt Banker for about 14 years. So that corner kind of prompts the conversation. Well, and how long have you been doing this, Bob? Anybody want to take a stab? Less than a year. I just got in the business. I'm leaving a career in, I don't even remember what it was. I'm a bad listener, which is not good for this class. Being a bad listener is not helpful in this bit. Why do women make better real estate agents than men? They listen. Okay. So lesson number one, men, if you start taking notes, start listening a little bit better. Your business will increase. Okay. I'm a bad listener. It has not served me very well. So at any rate, I don't remember what he, career he was coming from, but he was coming from whatever he was coming from. And I've been in the business for less than a year. I'm like, ah, okay. Fair enough. Um, so then he proceeds to say, well, what do you think I should see? What, what, what sessions should I see? What speakers should I see? What classes could I see? And for those of you that have gone to these events, these classes have really funky names. You know, they're like, you know, this is an odd how to sell through telepathy or some nonsense like that. And you're like, what does that mean? Okay, well, the names of these courses are, are stupid. So I'm like, I don't really know the names that you should see, but I do know the speakers. I know the people that you should go see. So this conference, of course, has an app. So I go to the Gem Blue app, and it's dark, and we're in this big stadium. We go to the Gem Blue app, and I pull up the app, and I go to the speakers, and I'm starting to scroll through my phone. And I'm like, okay, well, I think you should potentially go see Tom Ferry. We're going to talk a little bit about Tom today. Maybe one of might go see Matthew Ferrara. We'll see a little bit, talk about, about him. And I start going through this, and this is what he does. He reaches into his pocket. And he pulls out a piece of paper, and he unfolds this piece of paper, and it's dark. You got to remember, we're in this, this stadium, and the lights are down. And I'm like, hmm, okay, what's on this piece of paper? So I take my phone, got a little bit of illumination to it, and put my phone in front of the piece of paper. And this is what I see. I, I wish I should. I, I was going to show. I don't have a, a screenshot of it. What I see on this piece of paper is a handwritten agenda. Now, it's not just the two or three things, and some of you in this room, this is where I could get offensive, and I apologize. 
So it's not just that he has written on this piece of paper, I want to go see Tom Ferry at 2 o'clock, and I want to go see Sally Smith at 3 o'clock, and the four things he wants to see. What he has actually written is he has written out the entire agenda by hand. And I'm like, this is very interesting. Why would somebody do that? Number one, why would they do that when they can print it out? I mean, if you wanted the entire agenda, why would I write it when I could print it? And then some of you in the room might be saying, well, why would I print it when I've got an app, and I've got an app that I can do all these little stars and all these little, these little things to it. So as I'm going through this, I'm, I'm looking at my technology, and I'm looking at his technology, and I honestly just felt terrible for this guy. I literally, my heart just kind of sank. And I'm just thinking to myself, you, you got the look, and you've got the presentation, and you look pers professional, but in my opinion, there is no way that this guy is going to survive in this real estate business. No way. Now, does that mean he can, he's never going to sell a house? Of course not. Which, by the way, that next tier of agents, we mentioned to you that 50% of agents don't sell a thing in a 12-month window. Zero. Okay? Well, then there's about another 10 to 15% agents that are in that next tier that do sell something in their, in their, in the 12 months of business. They'll sell one, maybe two. Who are they selling those homes to? Family. They're selling it to their friends. They're selling it to their family, which is probably what this gentleman will end up doing. Number one, does he need to make a money selling real estate? No. He's selling real estate. Okay. Um, if he does get an opportunity to work with a client, more than likely it's going to be a friend or a family member. And they will probably tolerate Uncle Bob's way of doing business. Okay? I'm not so sure the rest of the consumers will. I don't know that the rest of the public is going to tolerate the way Bob is doing business. So before we, obviously I haven't even got started yet. I just wanted to go on this little mind dump here before we get this to kind of set the stage. Um, everyone's heard the 80-20 rule. If you haven't heard the 80-20 rule, 80-20 rule is 80% of the business is done by 20% of the realtors, okay? And I've heard that since the beginning of time, okay, my 30 years. Over time, it's become the 85-15 rule. Now, today, it's more like the 90-10 rule. 90% of the business is being done by about 10% of the agents, okay? Now, if you're in that 10%, and a few of you 10%ers are here, by the way, which is great, um, you're like, yeah, I like it that way. I'm going to keep it coming, all right? But this is the deal. I think it's going to get better or worse, depending upon what side of that equation you're on. I don't think we're going to be at an 80-10 or an 80-20. I think we're going to be at a 90-10. I think there's going to be a very short window of time, and it's probably going to be within the next five years. Well, that number is going to be closer to 5% of the realtors are going to do 95% of the business, which is a pretty interesting um, dynamic, I think, for all of us. Now, if you're already in that 80% or in the 20% or in the 10% or you're already in the 5%, then you've already gone through this process. You, I'm assuming, already have a business plan. You're working that business plan, and you're doing your thing. Okay? But the reality is, for most of us in that room, we don't get to that 20% or that 5 or 10%. We're in that percentage. We're struggling. We're in that 80% right now trying to go, or we're in, get my percentages right here. I'm in the 80% of the agents trying to scramble after a small percentage of business. This is, this is my plea today, and this is going to be the theme of what we're, lot, we're going, to go in, going to go over today, is this business is dramatically changing. And if you truly want to stay in this business, and, and again, you may not want to close 80 transactions a year. You may not need or have the desire to close even 20 transactions a year. That's okay, okay? Um, if, if any of you guys have sat through my recruiting presentation, and I personally recruited you, I've told everybody, you don't have to be a rock star to work in my office. You don't have to be 
closing 30, 40, 50, 80 deals and making hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's okay to close two or three transactions if that's where you are in your life, as long as you're professional and you treat your clients well, okay? The challenge, I think, with so many of the, the and, and by the way, what I'm going to say right now applies also to the people in the, in the 10% or even in the 5%, the rock star agents who are killing it. There's a lot of unprofessionalism in this business. Tremendous amount of Charlene's going to sit on a panel for us earlier, and we had a brief conversation on Sunday. Just, and not to steal some of your thunder um, when we talked earlier, but how long is your listing presentation approximately? Well, once we already have gone to the house a couple of times and talked with them and looked at the house, um, we get all our disclosures together, which takes a great deal of time. And we have everything signed by us. We have everything organized as to how we want to present the disclosures to the seller so they're not confused or overwhelmed. We have them CMA there. We might decide on a price, we might not. We go through every single disclosure, including that seller property questionnaire, how they put it on a detachment, how they address each question, the defects, the, the repairs, the upgrades. It takes us a minimum of two hours, and it's more likely three, and we've gone at least to four. But I could tell you that when we're finished, we get to the commission part of the contract, which I always say to the end. Nobody in my 31 years has argued with me about commission. Okay, Charlene, stop there, because we're going to, we're after lunch, we're going to set up a panel. And I'm no, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let Charlene finish the rest of that story. I just wanted her to kind of set the stage a little bit for me to, to right now because it ties into um, it ties into one of the challenges with our business. Okay. And by the way, I'm all about the technology. I am all about it. If you are not prepared to take advantage of the technology that is available today, I think you are gonna be in big, big trouble. However, I'm also all about the time we're spending with our client, the FaceTime, whether it's the, when I, when I mean, fa and I don't mean FaceTime, okay? Um, the time that we have in front of our client, whether it's on the phone, whether it's in person, um, and setting Charlene up for that question, how long do you spend for a listing presentation? The first thing she says is, well, after I've already visited the property a couple of times, which kind of, she's got a little bit of a plan that says, I probably just don't go out and, and take a when I get a phone call at one o'clock. If I get that come list me call, maybe I have a plan that says, well, I got, a, I got some, a series of steps that I go through. I visit the property first, I do an inspection, I set a follow-up appointment, I do whatever I happen to do. Um, she prints out all the disclosures. She goes through the disclosures, goes through the disclosures. Did I mention that she goes through the disclosures? Okay. Most of us don't do that. Most of us send email to our clients and say, hey, nice to talk to you on the phone. I think your house is worth 650. Check your email box. Everything looks good. Um, um, just go ahead and sign it and shoot it on back, and um, I'll get the sign in the yard tomorrow. Okay? Which almost prompts um, conversations about commission. I was hoping you were going to say that, because after she goes through all of this stuff and she establishes value to her client, Commissions generally don't come up. Sitting back and saying, wow. I mean, it, well, it feels like it's cutting out, though. I will right, we'll play with it. I've got five of them up here, so if this one fails, we'll try another one. So at any rate, commissions generally don't come up. And why would they come up if, if the seller is basically Charlene's presented her value, the value of her team, okay? Now, that's old school. That's, that's, that's old school, okay? So what I hope a lot of you come away with today is a combination of some of this old school real estate stuff mixed with some of this old school stuff. Because the problem with, with a lot of the way we're doing our business today is we don't have either. We don't have the old school ethics and presentation and just, you know, again, Charlene and I spoke on, on, on Saturday or Sunday 
In the old days, we presented others face to face. That's just how we did it. You know, we'd have an open house on Sunday. We'd have an offer written on Sunday afternoon. Another agent would call us and say, hey, I've got an offer on your house on Main Street. And it'd be 7 o'clock at night. I'm having dinner with the family. And it would be like, okay, I'll meet you at the house at 830. And the clients expected, when we took that listing, we told that seller, hey, you need to be available. I may be coming over to your house at 8 o'clock at, on, at night on Sunday after an open house. And we told that when we wrote the offer, hey, I'm going to go present this tonight, and I might not get back to you until 9, 10 o'clock, but you need to be available. No, I'm going to work. I've got to get up early in the morning. No, 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 no. You need to be available because I will come over to your house at midnight, and I will get this contract signed. And we will get these deals done. And in the old days, we got deals done in 12 hours from start to finish. Today, it takes 12 days, 13 days, okay? In part because our business practices have changed. In part because we've kind of got this new technology thing we hide around. We don't set appointments with our clients anymore. Everything is e-signed, which, by the way, I'm all about it. I'm going to talk, talk out of both sides of my mouth all day today. I am all about the electronic signatures. I am all about, hey, I'm not going to spend four hours with my client. I've got six appointments today, and if I can get it done in one, um, if you can get it done in one, fine. But anyway, the business is changing. And with that in mind, to kind of set the stage, if you don't have a plan, you're screwed. That's all I can tell you guys. If you don't have something in, in writing that is putting you on a specific path, you are going to get run over. You are truly going to get run over. And guess who else is going to get run over? Broker owners. Broker owners. This business is changing. A lot of the stuff that I'm going to talk about with you today to Cobalt Banker Town and Country, just as much, if not more, than it applies to the individual agents in the audience today. Okay? This is changing so dramatically. This is this sort of stuff that kind of keeps me up at night. Charlene. I'm going to probably use Charlene's example a lot because I, I, I've known Charlene now for almost eight years. I've watched her from afar for eight years and a little bit up close over the last several years. And I see an individual who has a business plan, executes her plan, and just basically rinse and repeat and does it in a, in a very professional fashion. Okay? And then I'll see someone new that comes in the business, maybe like, like Kristen, who's who worked in the office in Rutherlands for a while, is now in the business for a year. And doesn't have those 30 years plus years of experience and doesn't have a database of clients and has to do business maybe a little bit differently. But, I, and, but then I take a look at pressures on commission. Who has been on a listing appointment where commission was, was a topic of concern? Okay. All right. And that's legitimate. Absolutely. And sometimes it's the very first thing. You love those clients. Well, the very first thing they ask you, they don't, they don't want to know anything about you. They don't, know anything, they don't know anything about who they want to buy. First thing they say is, oh, by the way, you know, can you, I, I, saw, I saw an ad on television for Purple Bricks. Who's ever heard of Purple Bricks? Who heard of Purple Bricks two months ago? Three months ago? Four months ago? Okay, so a few months ago, we never even heard of Purple Bricks. So for those of you who didn't raise your hand ever, here they come. Here they come. Big, big money. Big, big real estate. Television commercials. It's hard not to see the television commercials. What do the commercials say? Yeah, some, whatever you guys said, that's what they say. Okay? <laughs> they basically say something about why are you paying Chuck all this money and we'll do it for less. That's their value proposition right out of the gate. It's not that they're better. It's not that they're more professional. It's not that they add more value. Their value proposition is, we'll do it for less. Which all the more reason we have to connect with those clients. We have to build trust with those clients. We have to make sure those, those clients understand what our value proposition is, which is one reason I love Charlene's model. Is because if some, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm stealing some of our thunder for the, actually, I'm going to save this question for Charlene later, but I'll just ask the crowd. Okay, If someone calls you and the very first words out of their mouth is, hey, I'm really interested in selling my house, um, but I'd like to know if, if um, um, you, you'll do it for 4.5%. What do you guys do with that? 
do you just do you kind of just pucker up a little bit and and kind of deflect it, or do you say sure, no problem? Chris, what do you do with that? So he wants to get in front of them. Does that mean you want to take it for four and a half? Of course not. He wants to get in front of them, and again, we'll talk about this when Chris comes up on the panel, but I'm going to assume he's going to say something. In fact, I want to show my value. I want to get a client. I want to develop some trust, and I want to show is more than whatever number they have in mind. Who just walks away from that? Nobody just walks away from that? Some of you walk away from that. Paul walks away from that. By the way, I saw your RV. God, you poor thing. <laughs> well, you can talk to Paul later about his poor RV. Um, so at any rate, so we're going to rock and roll here. We're going to get going. But again, I wanted to set the stage very, very quickly to let you know that things are different. This business is different. I am thoroughly convinced that five years from now, if we could get in the old time machine and we can move forward, this business is going to look dramatically different. Your business is going to look different. My business is going to look different. The number of agents conducting business and surviving in this business is going to be different. I think it's absolutely going to be different. And if we're not prepared to take a look at that today, make proper adjustments and changes in our business, we may have some trouble. We may have some trouble as it relates to how we operate. Um, and do we operate? Can we operate? Can we make any money in this business? Okay, so let's go ahead and rock and roll here. So we're going to start off with a plan. Okay, and the plan can take a whole variety of different, um, by the way, we're using the Glengarry Glen Ross theme for the today. Who has seen Glengarry Glen Ross? Okay, for those of you that don't get any of this jokes and stuff that are associated with this presentation, so probably a little bit too obscure of a reference for this particular presentation, but we're going to use it anyway. The Glengarry Glen Ross movie, for those of you that haven't seen it, okay, it's not really a great movie, to be honest with you. I've seen it a bunch of times. I watched it again on Saturday. Um, can you turn the air on? Is it hot or cold or just perfect in here? Okay. I'm going to start sweating here in a minute. Um, anyway, it's not necessarily the best movie in the world, but it is, in some ways, a sales movie. Okay? And by the way, if you do watch the movie and you kind of like, ugh, Lance likes this movie, I, I, I like parts of the movie. I don't like it relates. I don't like anything as it relates to the sales aspect of, you think it's that? It feels like a, it's like it's Um Okay, anyway, the sales aspect of this movie I don't like. I don't particularly care for it at all. It's kind of vulgar, it's kind of disgusting. It's very sleazy sales, okay? So for those of you that say, oh, Lance said go home and watch Glenn Gary again, Ross, and, and it's, it's gonna help me out with my business plan. I don't want you to be like these guys. Not at all. And for, if you're laughing, maybe you've seen the movie and you're like, okay, well, good, because I don't want to run that type of operation. These are really, really sleazy sales guys, okay? Having said that, there's a lot of stuff in that movie that is so brutally true and so brutally honest as far as how we are with, as, a sales, as salespeople. So we're going to make some references to this. Um, this particular quote is always be closed. See, it's a very simple sales thing we've always talked about. And we're not going to spend time today, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time today talking about sales techniques, okay? Having said that, everybody in this room needs to have something in their business plan that says, I need to improve my ability as a salesperson. This is a sales business, okay? And if you are not, good morning, Paul, um, if you are not improving your sales skills, I'm not saying you're not going to sell a house or two, okay? You probably are going to sell a house or two, but this is a sales business, okay? We spend a lot of time, and sometimes we spend too much time on contracts, how to fill out a disclosure, how to fill out an RPA, how to fill out a listing agreement, how to do blah, 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 and very little time on actual sales skills, okay? I'm not a natural sales guy. When I first got into this business, I was petrified, okay? The idea of role playing, um, the idea of the, my first listing presentation, awful. You think that one's gonna be better? The first listing presentation was terrible. There we go. Would you hurt yourself on climbing the hill? Paul's a madman, by the way. 
Who's friends with Paul on Facebook? And what, is, what is that thing you're doing? What is, what are you, the Spartan? Paul, Paul is a Spartan. Paul is climbing hills and, and doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Anyway, Paul is just a madman. So, which by the way, who is, who is not friends with Paul on Facebook? Okay. All right, well, we're going to, again, I'm, I'm all over the map. For those of you that have ever you know, been in a seminar speech with me before, I tend to, to, to bounce around a lot. Um, guys, you've got to engage. You've got to engage. You've got to be a madman on all this social media stuff. You have got to get in that space or you're going to get run over. And many of you may, ah, oh, I don't need that. And some, Charlene may not need that. Charlene's been doing this a while. Charlene's got a book of business. Charlene has clients that she's been professional with and taken care of. Those people will feed Charlene and Mike and Colette and that team for as long as they want to do it. Probably never has to go on Facebook ever. Never has to shoot a video ever. Never has to do any of that stuff that she, eh, I didn't do any of that. Okay? Charlene can get away with that because she's already in the 5%. She can get away with that. I can get away with that. I'm already in the 5% when it comes to that stuff, okay? But most of us here can't, okay? We've got to engage in that way. So at any rate, we're going to talk a little bit more about some closing stuff. We're also going to talk about a budget. If you, don't not, if you do not have some sort of a budget, you need to, again, you guys should be taking notes. I need a budget. How much money am I going to spend this year, and what am I going to spend it on? Am I going to spend it on, 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 on Zillow? Am I going to, Carlos is doing some advertising back in old print media, you know, doing Homes and Land magazine or something like that we just talked about the other day. So he's, his business plan has, for at least for a moment, said, I want to go back and take a look at some of this old school media, branding purposes, okay? Um, I want to do some branding. So I have to have a budget for that. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later. What are the tools that I'm using? Who's using Cobalt Banker Global Luxury? Who's using CBX? Who's using Facebook as a tool, Okay. Who, and again, one of those tools, we're going to kind of bounce around here, Homes and Land Magazine is a tool. It's a media tool. It's an advertising tool. But what tools are we using? What are you doing? This is really what it boils down to. This is what worries me about this business, and this is what worries me about everybody in this room. Okay? The action is probably the most important thing out of everything that we're going to talk about today. We're going to have all sorts of cool ideas and things we're going to do, and yada, da 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 Some of you are going to take great notes. Some of you aren't going to take any notes at all. And you're going to go back. Maybe you're going to be inspired for two minutes. Maybe not. Maybe you'll be inspired for a day or two. And then no action. Not doing anything. I'm just doing or I do what I've done in the past. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about action. We're going to talk a lot about talking about a CRM. Who has a contact management program? Raise your hand. I know you don't, I'm going to ask a lot of questions. Many times you will not respond appropriately, but I want you to answer this one right now. It's the only time I'll ever ask you to be 100% with me. Raise your hand if you have a contact management program. Okay, the rest of you are, are going to be out of business. The rest of you are out of business. If you did not raise your hand, I'm sorry, but your business is over. You just don't know it yet. You may not be out of business tomorrow. It may be five years from now, but I'm telling you right now, you're already out of business. Okay? Sorry. Sorry. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about a contact management program. Talk a little bit about coaching. Go Dodgers, by the way. Had a great game last night. Woohoo! That was a lot of fun. Who's going to the game tonight? Anybody? Okay, we're going to keep an eye on ticket prices throughout the day. Eight fifty? No, no. I think they've come down, Drew. Where are they? They're, are they down? Oh, down in the sevens. We're going to see. I'm hoping they, you know, they get a little bit more comfortable, and who knows, maybe we'll jump in someone's car and we'll run to the game after this. Seven, <laughs> 750. At any rate, we're going to talk a little bit about coaching. Who's using some sort of coaching product right now? I'm fairy or alike. Four or five of you. Okay. Um, and we'll talk about why that's important. Um, we're going to talk about building a team. Um, Chris has a team. Carlos is building a team. Charlene's had a team for how long? How long have you had your team? 20 years. Okay, we had a team. Okay, we're going to build a team. Not all of you need those types of teams, okay? Most of you don't want or need those types of teams. But we're going to talk a little bit about what type of a team that you might get. Is Annette going to be on your team with Orange Coast title? Is Kerwin with Wells Fargo going to be on your team? 
okay? We're going to talk a little bit about those type of teams and whether or not you're going to just build a, a single agent team with a couple of assistants, which, by the way, for those of you that are thinking about team building at the moment, don't necessarily think you have to have a team with 30 agents on it, and that's the end result. Start with a team with, with an assistant, someone to help you with paperwork or two, or a little bit of marketing, okay? You don't have to go through and find buyer's agents and showing agents and, and, and uh, anyway, we'll talk a little bit more about the team side. We've also got a panel, Charlene and Chris and Carlos and Fred and myself are gonna break sometime after lunch. Um, we are gonna have a very short lunch just from a content perspective. We're gonna have a very, very short lunch, probably half hour, 45 minutes. We're gonna bring them up immediately following. I'm not really sure how that's gonna go from a timing standpoint. It, we may just turn it into an open dialogue and we may spend the rest of the afternoon talking to these four people about how they do their business and how it goes or maybe we'll just spend five minutes and kick them off the stage real quick. Something tells me it'll probably be a little longer than that. Okay, and we're gonna talk a little bit about closing. So, we're gonna start off with the plan. Okay, same slide I used last year. So for those of you, oh, it's the same slide. So here we go. If you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up somewhere else, okay? Quote's been around Yogi Bear forever. He's got the funny little quips and all the rest of that sort of stuff. True? True. This also is my why, and this is where I think you guys really need to start thinking about this, and it's going to be my theme of this entire day is why are you here right now? Why are you really in this room? Why are you at Cobalt Banker Town and Country? Why did you get your real estate license? Whatever your goal is, if you want to close, I'll just use the number that's so easy. You want to make a hundred grand. Everybody that's new to the business always seems to have this goal. I want to make a hundred grand. That's a pretty crappy goal. You know why? Because that's the same goal that I had when I got in the business 30 years ago. Just adjusted for inflation, and you would think that the goal would be higher. But I think that tells us something. I think that tells us something about our industry. So what is your why? Why are you here? Why do you want to make 100 grand? If you don't have a good why, I will tell you, you will not make 100 grand. There's got to be a reason. Anybody want to know what my why was when I was a young agent, when I first got into the business? I was married. I had kids, I had a house payment, and I had nobody to help me. Is that a good why? That's my why. And I was brought up by my folks to take care of business. You know, you, you took care of your family and you paid your bills on time when you could. But if you couldn't pay them on time, you paid them, right? So my why was... I was in love, I got married at 20, and part of my why, quite honestly, wasn't the kids and wasn't the bills, it was I was in love and I wanted to impress my girl. And, and, and impressing my girl meant you gotta make a living, right? That was my why. Now if we don't, and I don't know, everybody's got different whys, maybe you wanna, you know, you wanna prove somebody wrong, you know, your dad was an asshole and kept you down, and, I can do it, Dad. I'm going to show you. If that's your why, then cool. You know? But you got to have something. If you don't have something, it ain't going to happen. So getting back to our plan, let's be honest today. This is not going to be a lot of raw, raw stuff. We're kind of heavy start here. I'm going to build it up. We'll tell a few jokes. We'll laugh and all the rest of that sort of stuff. But we're going to be honest with each other today. Okay? And by the way, I'm adjusting this, my presentation, based upon my business plan is changing. My business plan is changing. I have our, my current goal, we have about 280 some odd agents in the office right now. We had a goal to recruit 120 agents this year, which we're falling short of, to be honest with you. But our goal is, I wanna be huge. Seven, seven more offices, 1,200 agents. I think I'm adjusting my goal because I'm not gonna coddle this person anymore. I'm not gonna just say it's okay, you're gonna be fine, this business is easy, you just had a bad day. I don't think I'm doing anybody any, um, any good. I don't think I'm helping them, I don't think I'm helping me, okay? And I'm sending those people out into the world with the Cobalt Banker Town and Country business card. And what are my two rules for working in this company? Somebody 
Be professional and take care of your clients. If I, if I as the broker owner, am, am sending realtors out into the world just because I wanted to add an agent count to the roster and they're not professional and taking care of their clients, who am I kidding, right? So we're going to be very, very honest with each other today, and I would suggest that, that you guys do the same, and maybe something good will come out of this. Okay, so the plan. This is a business. Let's start with the basics. Everybody got that? Who had a job before they got into real estate business? Keep your hand up if you have some sort of income that still comes from that job, if you have a pension or if you have something like that. God bless you. God bless. I, sometimes I tell my kids, geez, you guys should have been cops or firefighters or something like that. And put in your time, and God bless you, nothing bad happened. You retired when you're 45, and you get paid. And How cool would that be? Well, we didn't do that. Who did that? Uh, okay, so a couple of you did that. Well, God bless you that if you were smart enough to do that, but now you're in a different business, okay? And for those of you that raised, I'm not going to stop making eye contact with the people who did that. For those of you that did that and you now have this nice little nest egg coming in, my question to you would be is, are you in the real estate business or are you just out having fun? Or is this just some place for you to go during the day? There are too many agents in our office and throughout this business that the real estate business is just a place for them to go between 8 in the morning and 5 o'clock at night. <laughs> Tough day today, honey. <laughs> Woo! Boy, the internet was a little slow. I was searching those properties, <laughs> drinking that coffee. It's, this is a business. And again, this is one of the reasons I am concerned about the future of our business, because so many people get into this business by the way, is it easy to get into the real estate business? Yeah. How easy is it to get in this business? How long did it take you guys to get your license and how much did it cost you? I hear three months, four months, six months. How much did it cost? 200 bucks, 300 bucks, 400 bucks. Let's just say it's 500 bucks in five months. Okay? Is that easy to get in? How easy is it to get out? Very easy. When it's so easy to get in, it's super easy to get out. Now, this isn't working. I didn't put any time into it. I did part, hardly any money into it. So therefore, if I failed at it and I want to get out, I, eh, whatever, I gave it a shot. Who has had a real estate agent get out of the business while you're in a transaction with them? I have. I have, They're, right? For those of you that are laughing, it, th that's not a joke. Right, because they're not in the business. Maybe they're at their other job, which is another question. Again, I'm gonna embarrass anybody. So you don't, raise your hand if you're comfortable. If not, don't. Who has, who is, has a job, excuse me, who is in the real estate business of Cobalt Banker Town & Country but also has a job? Tough, tough, not impossible. But tough, there's only four of you that raised your hand, I think. Statistically, like, the only person that's going to be left out of the four of you is Elena's, like, forearm. <laughs> okay? Because as a percentage of four, I think there's, like, a, you have, like, a 4% chance. So I can't cut you in quarters. So the only thing that's left is a little piece of Elena that's going to be in this business in a couple of years. It is hard. Nothing easy about this business. If you've got a full-time job and you want to sell real estate, can you sell a house? Yeah. Of course. Who are you going to sell it to? Probably friends and family. Because a real client isn't going to put up with your BS. Isn't going to put up with your inability to be available when they need to be, have you available. By the way, is that professional? No. Is that taking care of your clients? No. Is Cobble Banker Town & Country going to keep part-time agents at the end of this class? Maybe not. Two weeks ago, I would have said yes. Two weeks ago, I would have said, yes, come on in. The water's warm. We take part-time agents. Everything's fine. We'll take care of you. Things are changing, okay? And they're changing for, for Cobalt Banker Town & Country as well. We may sit back and say, 
We're not going to do that anymore. And if we do do it, we're going to do it in some very rare exceptions. Some very, very rare exceptions. So this is a business. It is not a job. Okay, we've got to answer some questions here. What do we need to know? Oops. Sorry, my clicker got a little ahead of me. Okay, what form is your business plan going to take? Who has a, business, a written business plan right now? Six of you. Okay. Um, that's okay. I've been doing this 30 years. For the first 13, 14 years I was in the business, I did pretty well. No plan. No written plan. Certainly had a plan, kind of knew what I needed to do. But my plan generally revolved around how many bills do I have, how many houses do I need to close to pay those bills, OK? Not really a plan. That was just kind of more of a survival deal, OK? Um, I have a plan today. The, plan, the business plan I'm using today is the business plan that I started about 16 years ago. It's the same Word document. It's just been tweaked and modified and it's now 50 pages long, all right? I would suggest you all take your business plan. By the way, I don't, this isn't a business plan. For those of you that have something like this, that's not a plan, okay? We, we need something that's basically, in my opinion, electronic. You need something that you can carry around on your phone, on your iPad, whatever method that you are going to carry that you can tweak and you can adjust and you can basically work with um, and live in, and live in. By the way, your business plan is not just a little document that says, this is how much money I want to make. That's not a business plan, by the way. That's a goal, okay? Oh, I want to close 24 houses and I want to make $290,000. Not a business plan. Goal, all right? Now, the goals go into your business plan, but we need to get some form of electronic business plan, in my opinion. Now, it doesn't have to be. If you're like, no, 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 I don't want to do that, that's fine. You can keep your little journal and all the rest of that sort of stuff as long as you access it on a regular basis. So what form is it going to take? Obviously, we're re recommending um, an electronic form. Your business plan needs to be a living document. What I would suggest we all do with your business plans is a minimum of twice a year. Go lock yourself away somewhere, okay? And I don't mean just for an hour. Go down to Palm Springs for a weekend, sit by the pool, put on the headphones, read your plan, take some time, digest it, and say, am I doing this? What am I not doing? What can I do differently? But it's a living document. You've got to take a look at what your plan is. Now, maybe you do that little Palm Springs thing, but then maybe you do it with your coach, or you do it with your team, or you do it with me. Um, but it's got to be a living document. Okay, where do we start? I like to start with the end game. So for those of you that don't have a business plan, might sound a little bit odd, but what's your end game? So don't answer these questions specifically, but if, if I'm Kristen and I'm brand new generally, I mean a year or so, what do you want your business to look like when you're done? Which is kind of can be really hard. What? What do I want my business to look like when I'm done? Okay, bless you. Yeah, what do you want it to look like when you're done? Do, do you, and so let me maybe put some little definition on that. Do, is your goal, I, I just want to be a really good agent working as an individual, and I want to do this for 30 years, and I, I'd like to make, you know, 300 grand a year plus 10% every other year, and that would be a perfect thing for me. Or I want a team. I want to be... Um, I want to be um, Tim Smith. I, my, my end, who knows Tim Smith? Okay, Tim Smith is probably one of the most successful real estate companies masquerading as a team in the United States. How many people does Tim have on his team? 30? 30. He's an agent with 30 people on his team in Newport Beach. I have no idea what his GCI is, but if he, if he personally isn't making eight, nine, ten million dollars a year, I'd be shocked. Maybe it's only four million. I don't know. It's a lot of money. Okay. So when you want to start with the end game in mind, who do you want to be? What do you want your business to be? Okay. I'll put this in perspective of me. My my end game might be changing a little bit. My current goal is I want to grow 
not just more agents, I want more offices. I still think that's part of my goal. We want to expand. I want Cobalt Banker Town & Country to be bigger. I'd like, I, I can't talk about it here, but I've got four locations right now that if I could put everything together, boom, we'd have four more offices and another 400 agents um, in two months. Is that going to happen in two months? No, but that's, that's currently part of my end game. Okay, so what do you want your business to look like? I think it's really important that you take a look at that. Um, so again, what do you want your company, your company to look like when you're done? Are, are, does anybody have any, and again, I'm, I'll, I'll go to Charlene here for just a second. And kinda, this is, I'm really stepping into some dangerous water here. Um, how many more years are you going to do this, Charlene? Are you going to do it till you die? Is that the plan? Okay. That's a pretty good answer. If you didn't hear that, I'll do it until I don't enjoy it anymore. Okay. Um, but it's for some of us, that might be, no, 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 no. I have an exit. I want to get out of this. Five years from now, I want to go do something else. I'm going to move somewhere else, and I want to be able to sell something. How many real estate agents do you guys know that have sold their real estate agent business. They worked at a company, they didn't own the company, they were an agent and they sold it. One, how many, who do you know? Okay, do you, you know what they sold it for? He sold it for $2.6 million. An agent, agent. Did you guys hear that? A real estate agent, not a company. By the way, there's a lot of companies that aren't worth $2.6 million. This is a single agent, probably with a, a team, probably with a book of business, that sold their business for $2.6 million. Anybody else? Anybody else know of anybody who sold it? I, I have a story that's not nearly as impressive as that, but when I first got in the business, there was an agent in Marina Valley by the name of Ron Caluzzi. He was certainly in the top 5%. As just a kicker, man, just took care of business, did fantastic business. Something in his life came up, and he needed, he had to move to Chicago. Some family situations, that was just boom. Sorry, I gotta, I, I've got to go. Families first, move to Chicago. He is the first realtor. He worked at REMAX in Marine Valley, REMAX Results. He is the first realtor that I know that actually had someone pay him for his business as a realtor, an agent at REMAX. And by the way, at that time, he wasn't this, this, this thing we got going with teams today. He wasn't a team. He had two or three assistants. I don't remember the exact number he sold his business for, but it was, it was north of six figures, um, 100, 250,000 bucks, something like that. Would it be nice for you guys to have a business that you could sell? Forget about whether or not you have a plan or you just want to do it for as long, because that's kind of my goal. I want to do this until the kids put me in a home, OK? Um, <laughs> You know, and I think, I think that almost happened the other day, by the way. <laughs> Put me in the car, and we're driving, and he gave me some Benadryl, and I was, next thing I know, I wake up, and I'm in some hospital lobby. Anyway, so, um, but I, I, I think, I, at least I want you to think about what, forget about, again, I want to retire in five years. What if... For whatever reason, something happened in your life today that would force you to move out of the area. Okay? Do you have anything you could sell? Anything that you could sell? If the answer is no, then again, that's okay, but I think you might want to think about this a little. This is one reason why I think everybody should have a contact management system. Everybody. I'll give you an example. Um, I mean, I'll just pick on Chris here for a minute, and I'm going to mess up his number. How long have you been in the business? What, eight years? Eight years, okay. The top agent, Marina Valley, may be the top agent overall in the company this year. He's doing great. Um, you have closed approximately how many transactions? 40. 40 transactions this year, and in the last eight years, a couple hundred? Okay, a couple hundred transactions. That, to me, that's a sellable book of business. If something happened in Chris's life today, and he had to move to Florida, 
I think he's got to sell. I think somebody would pay him money for that book of business. If there's a plan behind it, there's a contact management program behind it, and there's some meat behind it. I would say the same thing about Charlene. I, I, would, I would buy Charlene's book of business tomorrow if I was an agent. I would say the same thing about Diane Speaker. Diane Spen, how long have you been in Redlands? 30 years? 30 years. I'm one of the top agents in Redlands for 30 years. Okay. There's value there, okay? But there also is only value if you package it as a business. You have to have a business that says, here's my contact management program. And these are all of the people I've done business with in the last 30 years. And these are how I contact these people for the last 30 years. And these are how many of those people came to my client appreciation party last time. And these are how many people came to my real estate market forecast last time. And these are how many people come to my um, whatever you do, okay, and you'll have, a, you'll have a marketable book of business, but it has to be a plan. But I think you need to give some idea of what you want it to look at. I've got this wonderful little thing in my business planning called Start, Stop, Continue, okay? Start, Stop, Continue is really simple. Hopefully today, you guys are going to hear some ideas, and they're going to be things that you're currently not doing. By the way, I might have these a little bit out of order right now, but Stop, Start, Continue is the way I do it. You're going to hear some ideas, and you're going to sit back and say, wow, that's really, really cool. You know, I, you know, Fred, the new agent who's not here yet, Fred sat on the panel. He's brand new. He's only been in the business for six months. He said something I've never heard of. I want to, th I want to do that. Maybe for you, that's a start. Okay? Who is doing something right now in their business that they need to stop? Anybody? Okay. Okay. All right, Carlos, Irene, you raised your hand. I don't know what that is. But this is part of your business planning thing. You need to sit back, take a look at what you're, well, let's start, let's start at the top. What are you currently doing? Very simple. I'm doing this. Do I want to continue to do this or do I want to stop doing this? Okay. Um, but this is my suggestion. You need to have these discussions regularly. Okay. I'm doing something that's working. Well, that's easy. If I'm doing something that's working, then that's a continue all day long. Well, I'm doing something that I don't really know if it's working. Well, if you don't know if it's working, you better take a better closer look at it, and then you better determine whether it is working or you better stop it, okay? The start is easy. Starts, we all have a whole list of things we want to start doing. Okay, there's all, I want to start advertising in Zillow. I want to start calling back the people that call me from my advertising on Zillow. Yeah, right? Who has leads right now that they're getting that they're not calling back? Be honest. Okay, anybody who's doing any sort of advertising or marketing is getting leads and you're, you're, you're not following up on all of them. Okay, well, maybe that's a start. Uh, and then again, the continue is easy. So I love this. I use this in my business planning all the time. And when something triggers in my mind, I'll make myself a little note, I'll put it in my plan, and I'll sit back and, okay, you know, I just stopped something recently. Okay, it's going to save me 2000 bucks a month. Okay, I should have stopped it a year ago. 24000 bucks plus, boom, done. Okay, um, part of your plan, you need to be a good thief. Okay, um, I stole this from Tom Ferry. Tom Ferry stole it from somebody else. So what am I talking about? Every real estate agent in office needs an R&D department, rip off and duplicate department, courtesy of Tom Ferry. All right? You see a good idea, you steal it. There are no original ideas in the real estate business that I'm aware of. And if someone does come up with something that's original, fine. Steal it and make it your own and go do it. I don't care what that is. I don't care if it's a, it's a video that they're doing. I don't care if it's a slogan that they're doing. I don't care if it's a postcard. I don't care if it's the way they tilt their head when they get their pictures taken. Did you guys know, by the way, that when you're having your picture taken, if you like tilt your head to the right or to the left, it makes you look thinner? <laughs> Where's Ingrid and Stacy at? Where are they at? They're, they're not in the room right now? Oh, don't you dare cut that out of the video. We'll leave that in the video. <laughs> I learned that. I'm taking a picture with the girls, and I'm just there with my big old block head and my fat neck, and I'm taking my picture. And I look at the girls, and, and Stacy's like this, and Ingrid's like this, and, and I'm like, what? What is this all about? 
So that's what I'm talking about. So I have now, now when you take a picture with me, guess what I'm doing? <laughs> I, I haven't quite figured out whether the right or the left tilt is best for me yet. But at any rate, you need to rip stuff off and you need to duplicate the successful stuff. It's simple. Take a look at who's being successful out there. Take a look at what they're doing and steal it. And by the way, when somebody steals your stuff, whatever, go about your business. Don't get all upset, you know, <laughs> give me a break. Execute, take the stuff that's working out there, rip it off, duplicate it, put your face on it and make it your own. Okay, we wanna talk a little bit about ownership of your company. This is important. Okay, some of this stuff isn't really glitzy and fancy, but this is important stuff. So who owns you? You own yourself? Corporation? Spouse? That was a joke. Spouse? <laughs> okay. Point I'm trying to make on this is how are you currently doing business? Are you an individual? Are you a sole proprietor? Who's a sole proprietor in here? Who is incorporated? Only one of you? Next year? And, you, and why are you going to incorporate next year? Because taxes. Okay. When you're making a significant amount of money in this business, you probably need to think about incorporating and what is that going to do to help you from a tax standpoint. What I would suggest is don't wait until you've made a lot of money in this business, okay? You might want to do it in advance and save yourself a few dollars in taxes. Now, I'm not a tax guy. Go see your tax professional, figure all that sort of stuff out. But you, you, you can incorporate yourself as an individual in this business. Now, there are some tricks and some things that we have to do to make sure that we can pay you properly. And I'm not going to get into the rules of, wait a minute, can I pay you? You're not a broker and blah, 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 blah. There's all sorts of things like that. But there are other things as far as that you can take advantage of as a corporation that you cannot necessarily take advantage of as an individual. And it's not expensive to incorporate. And it's not expensive to stay incorporated. You've got to pay extra filing fees, 800 bucks a year, and you've got to pay your tax guy and all the rest of that. But again, who you are and how you incorporate is important. Um, plan for the unforeseen. What happens if you get sick? Who handles your trans? Who has been, remember a moment ago I asked you, who's been in a transaction with somebody that left the business in the middle of the transaction? Who's been in a transaction with an agent, another, on the agent on the other side, got sick? Or at least that, there were, that was their excuse for not calling you back. Right? Or the unforeseen. Something happens. They get sick or worse. Okay? Who has a plan for that? Who has a plan right now? If, if I would, I've got five open escrows. If I was to get sick, who's going to handle my business? You need to think about that. If you've got a team or an assistant or whatever, maybe your plan is me, which is fine. Maybe, but, but this is the deal. This is what I would suggest. If your plan is, oh, geez, something has happened. I need to check out of the business for a couple of weeks. It shouldn't be a panic. It shouldn't be a, who do I call? Do I call, oh, I'm going to call Norm. And maybe a lot of you that have relationships with me or Norm or Paul or John or Drew, it's just kind of automatic. You just kind of think about it. I just know if something happens, I can just shoot te a text to Norm and say, hey, Norm, I'm, I'm going to have to check out for a week and we have it taken care of. My suggestion is, if you don't have a norm, you need to find out who your norm is. And if your norm is me, you probably should let me know that. <laughs> and I'm not, I'm serious. You need to let me know that. Say, hey, Lance, I just want you to know I'm feeling fine today. But I have you as part of my disaster plan. If something was to happen to me, I want to know, can I rely on you? If Chuck needs to know, can he call me and re on a moment's notice, can he rely on me to handle his business for a weekend or a month? And if the answer is yes, then cool, then he knows. That way when something happens, he doesn't even have to think. It's not even a worry. He call, hey, oh, dude, it happened, and I, I need to go out of town for two weeks. Dude, I got you. We talked about this. I remember you're, you're solid. Or I might say, oh, geez, I'm not the right guy. Let me give you Norm's phone number. Norm's going to be able to help you out. But again, what's your plan? And again, when you get sick or worse, I think about this all the time. Sometimes I do stupid shit, okay? 
you know, I'm at the river and I jump out of a boat and I land on my head and I could have killed myself and not funny. I mean, I've had a couple of moments in my life where it's like that was Drew. Listen, are you guys ready for this? The the company, Drew and Drake and I, we go to Mexico, and the God knows where. No cell service, no service, no nothing. We're out in the dune buggy, middle of nowhere. Get hit by a cow or something like that. Who knows? Do I have a plan? Yeah, I have a plan. Does my wife like it? No. But, but these are the type of things, again, what's going to happen if something happens to you? What's going to happen to you if you get sick? Or even if a teammate gets sick. If you're starting to build a team, I'll give you some personal experience for those of you that are building teams. Or if you're not, forget about it, if you already have a team, you have a smaller team. I'm looking at Chris and I'm looking at Carlos and Charlene because you guys have some established teams. But let's just suppose you're just, you're, you don't have those type of teams, but your team is Kerwin at Wells Fargo and your team is Annette at Orange Coast Title. And if something, what happens if something happens to one of your teammates? They go out of business. They get sick. They're not available. What do you do? Are you confident that the person behind Kerwin is going to be able to handle your loan? I think you probably should be, but you need to verify that with Kerwin. Are you confident that the same thing with Annette? I had a situation on my team several years ago. I was doing a lot of foreclosures, and I relied upon people on my team heavily. Okay, I had one of my teammates basically kind of check out. Okay, literally. I was not ready. I, a business planner, written plan, I had a disaster recovery plan. I was not ready for that. That turned into a disaster for me because I would not plan. What happens one day if this person's not here or sick or worse? Okay, so you want to think through all of that sort of stuff and give it a lot of thought. There's a, some of you have heard this story, it kind of goes hand in hand with this. Who knows Tom Hardig? Tom Hardig is one of my mentors and um, I love him to death and I probably would not be here today if it wasn't for Tom. Tom was a small broker in Marino Valley, kind of was my mentor, coach and whatever. For probably about 15 years ago, for Christmas, Tom comes up one day, we're having a Christmas party and he gives me a little package and he says, don't open this now, open this later. Um, I got your Christmas present. Thanks, Tom. Felt like crap because, of course, I did get Tom nothing. Um, so I'm like, thank you. Can I get you a beer? So I go back to the office the next day, and Tom's present sitting there on, on, on my thing, and I open it up, and inside this box is a bow tie. And not a clip-on bow tie, a bow tie, a Mike bow tie. Did you tie that this morning? Okay, seriously, that's a tie? Okay, all right. So he gives, Tom gives me a bow tie. And I'm like, and you have to know Tom. I don't wear ties, number one. I, Todd, that bow tie, are you kidding me? So, um, so I immediately call Tom. And I thank Tom for his gift. And I'm like, okay, Tom, give it to me, baby. What's the, what's the message? What's the lesson here? What are you trying to tell me? He says, well, have you, have, you, have you tied it? You've put it on. I said, Tom, I don't know how to tie it. He says, well, I'll tell you, you learn to tie that bow tie and you call me back. So, and this was, this was a long time ago. This was before, you guys know how blessed we are? You, you kids, you kids know how blessed we are that we can go on the internet and we can learn how to do anything and we can watch a video. This was before YouTube. So, you know, this was before Google, I think. So I don't know when that was. It was a while ago. So I'm like, well, Jesus, how the hell? So I went to the library. <laughs> I didn't go to the library. I don't know who the hell I went to, but I went to somebody, and I learned how to tie the bow tie. And I called him back and says, okay, I learned to tie the bow tie. And he says, you're kidding me, right? And I'm like, no, I actually learned how to tie the bow tie. I don't, couldn't do it today, but I learned how to tie it. He says, oh, I didn't really want you to learn how to tie the bow tie. That wasn't the message. The message is... Your, at that time, my business was expanding. I was, by the way, I have a team. You guys are on my team. My team consists of about 30 staff, paid employees, and 275 agents. That's my team, all right? So your team's getting big, son. 
And what you need to know is you need to know how everything on your team is done. So if Chuck's part of your team and he's in charge of X, you better know how to do what Chuck does. And if Andre's on part of your team and she's in charge of Y, you better know how, what, how to do Andre's job. Because if Chuck leaves and Andre leaves and you don't know how to do their job, you don't know how to tie the bow tie, he's in charge of tying bow ties. I never learned that. Okay? She's in charge of sky slope. I never learned it. Okay? You know, um, Willie's in charge of getting disclosures out of zip forms, but I never learned how to do that. Drake does all my e-signatures. I never know how to learn, learn how to do that. Iran does all my marketing. I don't know how to do that. I just kind of sit back. I just run the team. <laughs> that works until it doesn't work anymore. Okay? And it doesn't work anymore as soon as some of those people start to leave. And as you'll scramble. You'll be in big, big trouble trying to fill that void. Now, you don't have to have a big team. You don't have to have a team like Chris's team or a team like my team. What happens when your title officer bails out on you in the middle of a transaction? Do you have a, a backup? And by the way, the backup doesn't have to be First American. The backup is, is when a net goes down for a week, who at Orange Coast backs up a net? Or my loan officer, or whoever it happens to be. And by the way, you're, you, you, most of you probably will never deal with Kerwin at Wells Fargo. You may be dealing with, with one of his loan officers. Okay? Well, that's okay, because I want to call Kerwin. When I got a problem, I want to know who, who, who on the team do I go to that's going to help me with my teammate. So at any rate, you've got to have these, these plans in place. Um, do you, again, do you have a disaster recovery plan? Who has a CRM program right now, contact management program? What happens if your computer dies? What happens if your laptop dies? Do you have a backup? Is everything in the cloud? It's so much easier today, so much easier today than it was before. But that sort of stuff, if, if, if the Internet went down for a week, would we, would you, who would be out of business? If you go into the office in Redlands and the Wi-Fi and the internet doesn't work, are you out of business? Okay, well, I go to Starbucks. The printer doesn't work. Are you out of business? Do they have printers at Starbucks now? They do? Okay. okay this is my point. This is my point. Is if something happens at the office, which generally is looked at at my fault, the Wi-Fi sucks, the agent computers suck, the printers don't suck, blah, blah, blah. Really? Really? Who in this office is completely, or in this room is completely self-contained? You can do business anywhere on the planet. You have your own internet connection. Doesn't matter whether the Wi-Fi in the office is no good. Doesn't matter. I'm on my, which by the way, a few years ago, this used to be magic. Now we all have these really cool things. And did you know for like 10 bucks, you can get a hotspot? Who has a hotspot enabled on their phone? For those of you that don't, huh? Get it. Get it. Okay, so do you have a disaster recovery plan? What is it? Uh, what's your mission? I, you know, who knows what my mission statement is? My, my, my not posted mission statement. Okay, the mission statement that we, the fact that I cannot repeat it off of memory means it's really not a mission statement. Because if it's not emblazoned in, if it's not on the wall, if I can't recite it. But our, our, our general mission statement is that we want to be the premier real estate company and support and service all of our clients and agents um, in the Inland Empire, period, blah, blah, blah. That's not my real mission statement. My real mission statement is I want to destroy my competition. I don't necessarily put that on the wall, though. It's not necessarily something pleasant that you, a client comes into and looks into the lobby. But you know, but maybe it is because it's honest, okay? Whereas a lot of these other statements aren't honest. When you go into the lobby, I'll, I've been giving Kerwin some love, so let's go into the lobby at Wells Fargo and we see this beautiful mission statement, which sounds just so beautiful and politically correct and everything's wonderful. When the real st mission statement is, Wells Fargo wants to make a boatload of money, okay? So anyway, do you need a mission statement? I don't know if you do. If, if you're into that sort of stuff, that's fine. For those of you that were here last year, um, this, is, this is a great mission statement. Who gets the joke? OK. For the two of you that didn't or did get the joke, we'll talk about that later. OK. Um, try this. Conduct yourself professionally. Treat your clients well. If you conduct yourself professionally and you treat your clients well, it's amazing the things that, that will happen. 
Okay, plan, DBA. Who has a DBA in the room? One of you, okay. There is um, a lot of, of push out there today about branding individual agents, okay? Chris has decided that's a good idea. Chris is top agent in Reno Valley, may be the top agent in the company this year. Remember that rip off and duplicate thing we were talking about a little bit ago? Might not be a bad idea if you're gonna be doing a little bit of self-branding to get yourself a DBA, okay? Does, is anybody using their name in there? Are, are you the Andre group or the Andre team or? If any, okay, if any of you are doing anything like that, you might wanna DBA it, okay? You know, Carlos Gutierrez, is there more than one Carlos Gutierrez? <laughs> of course there is. Yeah, and not only is there, at first Carlos is going, well, no, wait. And he's at KW, and at what KW office is he at? In Redlands, and where does Carlos work? In Redlands, okay? So, so if I'm Carlos, you might want a DBA the Carlos Gutierrez team, the Carlos Gutierrez group, Carlos and Gutierrez associates, and you want to cap, even if you're not going to use it, because you don't want the other guy to use it, right? How would you feel about that? That would suck. Yeah, that would not be good. So if you're going to use your name, uh, and by the way, most of us, even if you think you have a really, really common name, you probably don't. Okay, I used to think my name, nobody has a name Lance. Lance is a weird name, nobody's got that name. Man, every single time any sort of new technology has come out and I wanted to go grab LanceMartin.com, geez, I was two years behind that. You know, I wanted to grab the handle on Twitter, no way. I want to grab the website, no way. I'm so far behind it. So grab those DBAs, re record them at least in the county that you're doing business. Um, now again, if you're like, eh, I'm never gonna use my name, I would frankly, I would DBA it anyway. Even if you just, I have like 30 DBAs. I use two, okay? The other ones are just sitting there. I'm just protecting them because I don't want anybody else to get them, okay? So go get them and grab them. Designations. What professional designations or affiliates do you currently have or should you have or what do you need? Are you a realtor? Yes. Is it a big deal to be a realtor? I'd like to say it is. Not so much, okay? Not so much. Um, I'm a member of CAR. I'm a member of NAR. I'm a GRI. Who has a GAR? Which, by the way, if you're a realtor, you're automatically members of NAR and CAR. Who has a GRI? Graduate Realtor Institute. Okay, it'll cost you four or five hundred bucks. You get a little extra, you know, little designation on your card. Does the public see any any value to it? Probably not. Okay. Having said that, if you're looking to educate yourself, I get it. I highlighted CRS and CRB in red for a reason. Who is a CRS in this room? Who's a CRB in this room? Who's never even heard of them? Raise your hand if you've never heard of them. Never heard of them. Okay. This is the deal. Who'd like to close an extra two or three transactions next year? Okay. Who wants to... Who wants to quadruple their business next year? <laughs> Go from zero to four. That's not even quadruple. That's like a, I don't even know what exponential that is, okay? This is the deal. There's, and this is the sad part. Again, raise your hand if you have heard of a CRS. Okay. You want to get two or three extra deals next year? Go get your CRS. In my opinion, it is the only designation that NAR, and NAR, this is the National Association of Realtors designation, that they basically sponsor that will literally put money in your pocket. Why? Because most of you in this room don't know anything about it. You know who does know stuff about it? Is the top 10%. The top 10% of agents in this business are all CRSs. And by the way, CRS is Certified Residential Specialist. CRB is Certified Residential Brokerage. Okay, you can be both if you're a broker. If you're not a broker, you can just get the CRS. Why would I go get a CRS? Which, by the way, 
Anything worthwhile is not cheap or easy. These are not cheap or easy to get, okay? It'll probably take you several months, if not a couple of years. You'll probably have to travel. You might, because all the classes that are done are not in Southern California. You might have to go to Vegas or Houston or something like that. But this is the deal. CRS is a, is a club. It's a private club. And who refers other, their clients to other Cobalt Banker agents? Who's done that in the last year? Okay. You do that because it's the brand. You have some level of confidence, a level of value. And when you refer a client, you want to refer a client to another Cobalt Banker in Miami or wherever you're doing. If you're a CRS, you'll do the same thing. But you're going to, instead of saying, I'm referring it to the Cobalt Banker Miami, you're going to refer it to the Cobalt Banker Miami CRS. Okay. Why would you do that? They're better agents. Oops, sorry. Who in here has their CRS? The CRS, they're better agents. If you look at NAR statistic, they do more deals, they're more professional, they do listing presentations like Charlene described. They're rock stars in the business. And, from a, and guess what they also do? They do a lot of referrals. It's a private little club, and they refer people back and forth and back and forth all day long. So I would suggest, as part of your start, stop, continue, I would, if, you're, if you guys are following that model, as a start, I would investigate. And, and by the way, not only do you have to put it on your list of things to do, you have to put a budget together for it because this will probably cost, probably cost you close to two grand to get this designation. The classes are three, four, five hundred bucks to do. I think you have to do at least two or three of them, and you'll probably have to travel. So it'll probably cost you a couple grand to get it. But I guarantee you, those of you that do it will get business. And it's good, for, it's good for two to three deals a year, okay? Easy. CRB, again, same kind of a thing. NRBA, not anybody an NRBA member? Foreclosure guys, okay? Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that later. Rio Mac, foreclosure guys. Um, NAREP, who's a member of NAREP? National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. How come only the Hispanics are raising their hands? <laughs> You're not quite Hispanic, are you, Andre? No. Well, okay. You're a member. Everybody in this room, irrespective of, of ethnicity, should be a member of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professionals. Why? There's business. There is business to be done there. Okay? Um, and, by, and again, you don't have to be Hispanic. I was on their board of directors. Yes. So there's business to be done there. Aria, who's a member of Aria? Kerwin. Why, do you, why are you a member of Aria, Kerwin? Business to, be done. business to be done. It's good business. Aria stands for Asian Real Estate Something Association, right? Yeah, something like that. Okay? So we've got the Hispanics, we've got the Asians. Yes, we should have joined those associations. Um, I got a couple of question marks up there. There's a whole bunch of question marks up here. These organ There's a new one, and this is not a joke. I'm dead serious when I talk about this. Help me out. NAWBA. What? NAWBA. NAWBA? NAWBA. Oh, the Women's Council? No. Um, no. Okay, there's a women's one. There's re real, realist. Realist is the um, NAREP. African American Association. I didn't list those. I probably should have. What's the one I'm looking for, Drake? NAGREP. I want to be a member of NAGREP. Why do I? First of all, let's tell them what the acronym stands for. National Association of Gay and Lesbian Real Estate Professionals. The LBGTQ. Okay. Do these folks have money? Do they buy real estate? They do. Do they want to be respected? Do they want to feel like they're connected with people who understand who they are and what they're all about? You need to, I, on, I'll be honest with you. When I first, and I was not originally a big fan of these. I'm not, I'm not, this is a lot of this, I don't want to get political, but it seems like there's a lot of separation going on. Can't we just all be a member of, of IVAR and be, and be, you know, let's just kind of just come on on and we don't have to separate by Hispanics and Asians and gays and lesbians and all the rest of that. I got it, and I, but I'm over that. Okay, for a long time, I, I refuse to do that because I think we all are just one color under the rainbow. These organizations are doing 
business, okay? And when I first, I had never heard of the, the one that Drake just said. What is it? Nagla Rep. I had never heard of Nagla Rep. And I'm going to be honest, and I'm on video, and I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm like, when I first, I kind of laughed a little bit. <laughs> oh, boy. Now we got another, another group, okay? But then I went to their website, and then I took a look at them, and they're a real deal. They are a real deal, okay? So all of these organizations, I believe you need to be a member of and you need to participate in. Now, can you really, truly participate in all of these and get the value? It's kind of hard, because I'll have meetings once a month. Next time, all you'd be doing is going to meetings all day. But I, I would encourage you to participate and take a look at those as much as you possibly can. Absolutely. But, this is all, but it's all networking. But it's all networking, OK? Um, the the Naglarep had their meeting in Palm Springs, um, I don't know, two, two months ago. And I got to tell you, I'm looking at, we were, Drake and I were somewhere else. We were, we were in New Jersey, wherever the hell we were. And I looked at that and I'm like, oh, I'm losing business. I need to be in Palm Springs with these people in their conferences, seeing what's important to them and participating and being their, being their agent. Okay. There is a lot of business to be had there. Okay. So who am I? Who do I want to be today? Who likes Wango Boingo? Am I the only Wango Boingo fan in the room? Yes. Okay. All right. So what kind of real estate agent are you? Let's, let's start talking about that a little bit. What kind of real estate agent are you? All right. Let's, let's, let me give you some help here. I am a listing agent. Who would classify themselves as a listing agent? I am a buyer's agent. Who would classify themselves as a buyer's agent? I do both. Who classifies themselves as both? Residential. I only sell residential. I do commercial. I do land. Okay. Um, I got it. You know, so this is the type of stuff that I'm talking about. You need to, you cannot make this stuff up on the fly. If somebody calls Carlos and says, hey, Carlos, I'm looking to purchase some um, land in Big Bear, um, Carlos needs to know immediately does that fall into his wheelhouse? Okay. Land, Big Bear. I don't do land. I don't do Big Bear. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I personally can't help you with land and Big Bear, but I love the opportunity to send you up to John Smith at Cobalt Banker, Big Sky, and blah, 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 blah. Okay. But this is the deal. And this same little, this little role play we're going through right now, we need to apply to everything. If somebody calls, who, okay, we're in Ontario. All right, let's just pretend for a moment we all had an office right here in Ontario and this is where we did business. All right, someone calls you up and says, I'd like, to, and let's pretend for a moment we all sell houses. Someone calls you up today, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Someone calls you up today and says, I want to list my house in Ontario. What do you do? Okay, right? Then they call you and say, I want to list my house in Pomona. Who says yes? Okay, I want to list my house in Rancho. Who says yes? I want to list my house in Victorville. I want to list my house in Barstow. Oh, okay, we got one. I want to list my house in Baker. Okay, at some point, right, at some point, we say, this is, I'm, outside of my, I'm outside of my window. Now, this is my challenge to you, is you need to define your window now. You don't want to define your window on the fly, OK? So it's automatic. If someone calls you and says, I have a residential property in the city of Barstow, can I, I'd love the opportunity to list my home with you, the answer is yes. I'd be happy to help you. I do business in Barstow. It's part of my service area. Without hesitation. Now, if they say, I love to list my vacant land in Barstow, and you don't do land, again, without hesitation, oh, you know, I'm very familiar with Barstow. However, I only deal in the residential market. However, I'd be happy to help you with the referral to the vacant land market. Who stumbles across the commercial lead? Anybody stumble across? And what do you do with them? Okay, well, you call me, okay? 
Well, this is the deal. If you stumble across that specific lead, you need to know immediately whether it's in your wheelhouse. There's no guessing. There's no guessing. Okay, the time for guessing is when you're doing the business plan. And the, and the business plan is if I want to do land in Barstow, it's in my business plan today that says this is the type of, this is who I am. I am a vacant land specialist in Barstow and I don't have to think about it. Now let's take this to a different level.